So thank you so much. Well, I'm a little bit jealous this morning. Uh, I was told that you could hear Josh better than you could me. So can you hear me okay back there, Alan? How about you, Joe? Can you hear? All right, all right. Uh, turn me up or do something, because I, I want you to be able to hear uh, what I'm saying. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, turn with me to the book of James, chapter 3. The book of James, chapter 3. We want to talk to you this morning about the taming of the tongue. The taming of the tongue. It was the largest battleship ever built in its day. It was commissioned August the 24th, 1940. It was named for German Chancellor, the Bismarck. It had eight 15-inch guns, 12 6-inch guns, 16 4-inch guns, 16 2-inch guns, 20 1-inch guns. It could travel at 30 knots. It was the huge, largest ship at that time that had ever been built. It was some, to give you an understanding, three football fields long. Three football fields long. At the Battle of Denmark Strait, it sank the British battleship, the Hood, the pride of the British Navy. Admiral Holland, along with some 1,400 men, perished. The ship went down so fast. Only three men survived the sinking of the Hood. The huge ship was turned by a little thing called a rudder. A rudder. When you stop and think, the power of a little rudder to turn a ship three football fields long. James, in his book, gives us six word pictures of the tongue. He talks about a bit, a rudder, a fire, a snake, a fountain, and a fig tree. Remember, James tells us, listen to what he said in verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, If any man among you seems to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. In the days ahead, we would like to see the power of the tongue to direct, the power of the tongue to destroy, and the power of the tongue to delight. James is going to talk about the tongue. Now remember the theme of the book of James is Christian immaturity, or could we say Christian maturity? In other words, the early church was talking religious and talking big, but they weren't controlling their tongues. So James takes a whole chapter to say, you better control that tongue. It's a little member. So listen to what he says, James chapter 1 the power of the tongue to direct. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that, we may, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm or a rudder. 
whithersoever the governor listeth. In other words, the governor was the, the rudder that, as they turned the ship. But notice, if you would, as James direct his attention, first of all, to people who are in authority in places of teaching with their tongue. Notice in verse 1, he says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. In other words, he's talking about the teacher and the tongue. The teacher and the tongue. Now the word masters there is the word that is used throughout the New Testament. In fact, uh, they refer to the Lord Jesus Christ by this name, Master. Master. In some places in the New Testament, in fact, in John chapter 3 and verse 2, you remember when Nicodemus came to Jesus, he called him teacher. That's the same word. The same word. In other words, masters are, uh, is a teacher, and that's what Jesus was. They often called him teacher, a rabbi, a master. That's what Jesus did. He, he taught people for three and a half years, taught and preached the Word of God. And what do we see? James is saying, be careful of wanting to be in place of leadership, of teaching, because that place comes with grave responsibility. Because you're standing in front of people teaching. So be careful. Teachers must teach the truth and live the truth. If I'm going to teach you, I not only need to teach you the truth, but I need to live the truth. If I'm going to preach to you from this book, the Word of God, I must not only preach the truth, but I must live the truth. Someone said that truth is caught more than taught. So again, we must be careful what we teach as our lives affect others. Now I want you to stop and think about it just a moment. You look back to a teacher that impacted your life, whether it be a Sunday school teacher, a school teacher, or a preacher that was a good Bible teacher. Now when you think about that person, what impacted, what do you remember most about that person? Now you remember their teaching and some of their lessons, of course, but probably what impacted your life more than their teaching was their lives. I remember a sixth grade teacher in public school, Mrs. Griffin. Every day when we got to our class, she would open the Bible and give us a devotion and a challenge. I remember the impact that that teacher had on my life and in my school. I remember Sunday school teachers that impacted my life. But you know, I, I didn't remember all of their lessons. But I remember the impact that that teacher had upon my life. Whether it had been Sunday school, elementary school, seminary, college. So James is saying to us, if we're going to teach, it's important to realize that with great authority comes great judgment. And the word condemnation means judgment. In other words, teachers have a grave responsibility. Our school teachers in our school have a grave responsibility to teach young lives. You Sunday school teachers have a grave responsibility to teach people the Word of God. Moms and dads, you too are teaching your children. It's important to understand that the God, God didn't give children to the government to raise. He didn't give them to the church to raise. And excuse me, He didn't give them to the Christian school to raise. You know what? Children are a product of their homes. Children are a heritage of the Lord. It's up to us to teach them the truth and the Word of God. So James says, listen, 
there's going to come great responsibility, judgment. Because what is, uh, Paul tells us, the inkling, could we say, the leaning of people in the last days? He said that they were heaped to themselves teachers, having itching ears. In other words, people want to be taught what they want to hear at times. It's important to give people the truth. You know, when you go to a doctor, you want the truth. You want the truth. Ten years ago, this time, I went to a doctor and he was telling me the wrong thing. Everything that he was telling me to do was making my back problem worse. And it got to a point where I was getting worse instead of better. I said, I need to change doctors. And I did. But how important it is to realize that we give people the truth, whether it be math or science or English or history. Think about the lies that are being fed to our children in schools. Think about the lies that are being fed to this next generation when it comes to God and the truth of God's Word. And this is why we say that James is saying one of the dangers of teaching and preaching is to tell people what they want to hear. And people need the truth. And that's what James is saying. You better be careful of standing in front of people because they need, need to hear the truth. The teacher and the tongue. But notice now he turns the pulpit to the pew in verse 2. For many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. In other words, James is saying that the person who can control his tongue gives evidence that he can control his body. Words lead to deeds. The mature man, James is telling us, is able to control his tongue and his actions. And it's interesting that the Word of God has so much to say about your tongue because the tongue has power to direct. Listen to what Solomon would tell us as he tells us much about the tongue. In Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 19, In the multitude of words there warneth not sin, but he that reframeth his lips is wise. The tongue of the just is as choice silver, and the heart of the wicked is little worth. Listen to what he says in verse 31. The mouth of the just bringeth forth wisdom, but the forward tongue shall be cut off. Verse 32. The lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked speaketh forwardness. Doesn't it seem like in these days people are saying things that just doesn't make sense? That doesn't make sense. The people are speaking these lies from their actions and their tongue. Proverbs 15 and verse 2. The tongue of the wise uses knowledge aright, but the mouth of fools poureth out foolishness. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. The lips of the wise disperse knowledge, but the heart of the foolish doeth not so. Again, listen to what he says in Proverbs 11 and verse 12. He that is void of wisdom despises his neighbor, but a man of understanding holdeth his peace. Proverbs 21 and verse 23. Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Proverbs 21 and verse 5. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to pleasant plentiness, but of every one that is hasty only to want. Proverbs 29 in verse 11. A fool uttereth all of his mind, but a wise man keepeth it till 
afterwards. And then, in the transgression of an evil man, there is a snare. But the righteous does sing and rejoice. In other words, the tongue. Your tongue has the power to destroy. Your, your tongue has the, the power uh, to control your body and your life. Why? Because that tongue is a powerful member, James is telling us. They used to say during World War II that loose lips sink ships. But could we say now that loose lips sink churches? Loose lips sink youth groups. Loose lips sinks families. Again, notice what he says in verse 3. The turning of the tongue. He told us about the, the power of this tongue and, and, and the direction that we can take it. But he said, we put bits in the horse's mouths. Now, many years ago, I went to uh, Camp Joy, not Camp Joy in Wisconsin. It was Camp Joy in Chattanooga, Tennessee with Highland Park. And it was, then I rode a horse for the very first time. Now, I was amazed at that horse who weighed four or five times more than I did, that I could take that bridle and just turn it to the right. And that horse would go to the right. I'd just pull it to the left and that horse would go to the left. And James is telling us the power of the tongue. Again, he used the illustration of a very small helm that has the power to direct a ship and which way it will go. And sometimes you and I can determine which way we are going in our Christian life is we need to tame this tongue. If this tongue has such power and might, how can we tame this tongue? The taming of the tongue. James is telling us to that early church, listen, your tongue has power to direct and you need to tame it. How can we tame it? It's an unruly evil, he calls it. Verse 8, full of deadly poison. He says, we bless we God, therefore we curse men which are made after the similitude of God. The same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. In other words, this tongue sometimes, uh, it says, oh, how I love Jesus. And then we go home and we say some unkind and unthoughtful remark to our home, to our family, to our kids, to our spouse, to, to our co-workers. How, how can I control this tongue? You know how we control it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's what Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. When he says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled. That word filled there means to be controlled by. In the book of Acts, it's used of an angry mob that was controlled by anger. But Paul is using it of a believer who's supposed to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. In other words, a, a drunken person does and acts a certain way that he normally doesn't. He drives a certain way that kills people. He, he says and does things that are evil and ungodly. Uh, it's excess. He said, don't be drunk with wine. But he said, you can be controlled by the Holy Spirit to say and do the things that you need to do. Holy Spirit control. So what does Solomon tell us in Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 21? Listen to what he says. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Again, David would tell us in Psalm 141, mark it down in verse 3. Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth and keep the door of my lips. And he uses the illustration of a watchman whose responsibility is to guard the gate, guard the door. 
Don't let anybody in or out without permission. And David said, God, set a watch over this tongue. Don't let anything come out of it that shouldn't be right. Don't let anything that come out of it that would be dishonoring to your name. Lord, guard this tongue. Paul would say in Colossians 4 and verse 6, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. So what can the tongue do? The tongue can build up and edify and encourage, or it can destroy, discourage, tear down a home or a family. It can gossip. Oh, the tongue, Lord, set a watch over my mouth. But if we're going to have the power of the tongue under control, and it takes the Holy Spirit, we must first of all see what the tongue's connected to and deal with that first. A lot of times we deal with symptoms and not the problem. And Jesus said we need to deal with the symptom is the flesh and the things that are in our hearts. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. In other words, whatever's in your heart is going to come out of your mouth eventually. And James tells us that. Look in chapter 3, if you're there, in verse 14. For if ye have bitter and envying and strife, where? In your hearts. Glory not and lie not against the truth. In other words, we have jealousy in our hearts towards somebody. And often we see this uh, in, in a lot of people. It may be in teenagers. It may be in moms and dads. That there's somebody that we're jealous of. That maybe they can do or say or, or a, a certain thing. Maybe they're gifted in athletics. or in, uh, Maybe it's in uh, uh, as far as their mind. They're, they're smarter than we are. They're gifted, more gifted than we are. They, they can maybe play an instrument or, or do a sport or do something. Maybe they've got a job that we always wanted. And we're jealous. And down in our heart that jealousy will work its way out to our tongues. Maybe we're bitter towards somebody about something that they've said or done and it works its way into our lives. In other words, usually we're going to say how we're thinking. And Jesus said, first you've got to deal with the heart then you've got to ask the Holy Spirit to take control of your life and your tongue and say the things that need to be said. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. How often times there's bitterness among siblings. There's bitterness among husbands and wives for something said or done. And we lash out with our tongue. There's bitterness toward brothers and sisters in Christ. Who is James dealing with? He's dealing with the early believers. And the way they talk to one another, the way they treated one another. But again, going back to James, listen to what he says. Who is wise, man, and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. He's saying exactly what he said before. Your lips and your life should match. Your lips 
in your life. The word conversation there implies the way that you live, your manner of life, the way you live. Now again, let, let's, let's get practical here. Well, how is the Holy Spirit going to control my tongue? Uh, first of all, I must confess sin. Is there bitterness? Is there resentment? Is there an anger? Is there wrath? Is there malice? Is there some things in our hearts and lives that we have towards somebody or towards some individual, toward a family member, a church member, a co-worker? If there's an unconfessed sin and an attitude in your heart that's not right, you've got to confess it first and make it right. And then you must say, Lord, Control my tongue. Help me to guard this old flesh. Well, how, I, I want to get practical. How, how do I do that? If I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, you know how, how I do it? I do it through the fruit of the Spirit. If you're listening and taking notes, put down Galatians chapter 5. Remember the fruit of the Spirit. There are nine of them. And you've heard me teach this and say this often. I believe that there are three that are related to God. The love, the joy, and peace. The love of God, the joy of the Lord, and the peace of God. Now again, they're all interrelated. They're all connected. Then there are three that relate to other people. If I'm going to demonstrate these nine, three of them directly relate to other people. I call it long suffering. It comes from two words. In other words, control your temper. Control your temper in relation to other people. Now we often say, oh, I just need to be patient with old so and so. Well, it's really not patience. Patience is usually in relation to trials. Long-suffering is in relation to other people. That's long-suffering. In other words, as one commentator said, we just got to put up with each other. It takes the fruit of long-suffering. And then he says, goodness, uh, well, uh, gentleness, rather, is next. That's more of an attitude. Remember, David said, thy gentleness hath made me great. Are you tender and receptive in relation to other people? Are you harsh and short and short-tempered and hard to get along with? You need the fruit of gentleness. Goodness is more of an act. So if I'm going to relate to other people, I need the Holy Spirit to help me in these three fruit. You can't do it in the flesh. You can't put up with people in the flesh. That's our problem. Jesus said, if your enemy hunger, feed him. Be kind to him. And then there's three that relate to myself. It's faith, meekness, and let me focus on the last, temperance. Now what in the world is temperance? Now we read that word and we read over it without any knowledge of whatsoever of what, what it means. What is it? If it's a fruit, what is it? What is the fruit of temperance? Let me give Jim Berg's definition of temperance. Here it is. It's just two sentences, but it's powerful. And I'll, I'll, I'll uh, summarize it. Temperance is a God-empowered mastery of internal desires. That's it. In other words, you have internal desires that can be good or they can be bad. For instance, uh, it might be hunger. It might be uh, sleep. It might be uh, different things like that uh, that are natural, but sleeping in church, that's not a good one. Sleeping when you should be going to work, no, that's not a good one either. A mastery of internal desires while cultivating the pursuit of Christ-likeness captures the heart. Cultivating knowledge informs the heart. Cultivating self-control trains the heart. In other words, knowledge of this book. 
the more I know about this book and tells my heart, you shouldn't act that way. You shouldn't talk that way. You shouldn't live that way. And then cultivating self-control through the power of the Holy Spirit trains the heart. Now again, uh, temperance can be uh, defined as uh, someone has defined it, is the self-control points to the inner power to control one's own desires and craving. The fruit resulting from true knowledge. In other words, temperance is a characteristic of, of God. All of the nine fruits are characteristic of God. But in particular, the fruit of temperance. We often call it self-control when in reality it's the Holy Spirit control of self. The word comes from the word that means to take hold of or to grip. So what am I saying? I'm saying, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit temperance to control this old tongue. Because it wants to say ugly things, cutting things, harsh things, unkind things. But I need your Holy Spirit control. That's how we control this tongue. Not in the energy of the flesh. Not working up and making a New Year's resolution. Is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the right thing and do the right thing. No, you need to deal with your heart and say, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit to set a watch over my mouth. Temperance is when your child carves his name on the back of your van with a knife. And you got to say the right thing. Temperance is when your two-year-old covers the dog in desitin. Temperance is when your student does it one more time. Temperance is, is when you're helping with the laundry and you shrink your wife's favorite shirt to a size four. Temperance is when your wife burns the supper. What are you going to say? Temperance is when the boss gives you one more thing to do just when you're getting ready to go home. Temperance is when the co-worker gets the job that you wanted. Are you going to allow bitterness? Temperance is when your one last nerve is broken at the end of the day. How are you going to respond? What are you going to say? The Bismarck. It's maiden voyage. Churchill gave the famous order. Here's what he said. To his navy, sink the Bismarck. Two ships had been looking for the Bismarck, the Rodney and the King George V. It had been damaged, but not very much. The hull of the Bismarck was so thick, it was said that when they found that some of the bombs and torpedoes just left dents. Two ships found the Bismarck, the Swordfish and the Ark Royal. They attacked to almost no avail. Two other ships, the Rodney and the King George V, had been looking for her and they found her. They attacked. They unloaded everything that they had. They said it was a miracle hit. John Moffat's plane dropped a torpedo and it hit the rudder of the Bismarck. And all it could do was go in circles. It was a sitting duck. So the British Royal Navy unleashed on that ship everything that it had. It was the largest ship in the German fleet on its maiden voyage. And they sunk it. They sunk the Bismarck.
God, help us to control our tongues or it will sink us. It will sink us. I've seen many a home sunk. I've seen many a church destroyed. Many a business becomes a terrible place to live and to work. We sang the song the choir did to open up. Hide myself in thee. How do I control this unruly evil? It's full of deadly poison. First of all, confess the bitterness in your heart. And ask the Lord, Lord, I need your Holy Spirit control to control myself. You know, and you'll say things you don't normally say. You'll act a way you don't normally act. In the church, in the world, on the job, with your family. The world doesn't understand this kind of thing. Because we live in a cruel, harsh, people let you have it in a second in this day in which we live. The taming of the tongue. Is your tongue tamed? James says the tongue can no man tame, but the Holy Spirit can. Would you bow with me in prayer? Sometimes it just takes, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have acted that way. I need to do better. Sometimes it takes a mess up with our tongue to realize, oh, this tongue will direct our lives to build up, to encourage, to enhance, or it will tear down a home, a family, a marriage, a relationship. When people say uh, ugly and harsh things toward one another, things you, you can't take back. The tongue will destroy a child's self-esteem, his ability, his, his uh, self-esteem and all that he understands by a sharp tongue. People are ugly in this day. Oh, even in schools, the bullying that goes on, the unkindness. Yea, could I say, even in our churches, James is talking to the church. He says, my brethren, God help us to get our tongues under control. Father, I pray you would help us today to realize that the tongue is an unruly evil. It's full of deadly poison. It will direct our lives. It will direct a church, a, a home, a family, a marriage. And Lord, may we ask God to set a watch over my mouth. Help us, Lord. Help us in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand please with your heads bowed? Four, six.